Amen. How you guys doing? What's up, Fearless Summit? So good to see you guys. Um, I am so blessed to be here. Um, I have to come to Kenya and to the Fearless Summit to dream big. As I prayed about what to share, I was um, led to talk today about being brave in influencing the government. Being brave in influencing the government, of taking on the Goliath of politics. Now, yesterday when Pastor M talked about the different sectors of society, we know that in order to influence and change society, it takes all sectors of society. The one that I took was church and mission. I mean, you kind of have to as a pastor, right? Like, you got to take the white band as, a, as the pastor here. And, and, I, and, I, and I strongly believe in the church. And in fact, I believe that the church is the most important, uh, the most strategic sector of all the ones. Not because it's necessarily the most important, but because it's the only one that has discipleship front and center of helping us be formed in the way of Jesus. Because if we're not becoming more like Jesus, it doesn't matter how much influence we have in other sectors of society, we are not bringing the truth of God to those places. So I believe in the church, but my, my passion is to see the church engage with the government in a healthy way. Somebody say healthy way. You know, government sector is, is one of the most challenging sectors to engage I think engaging with the government is sort of like playing with fire. And you know that fire has so much potential. You can cook with fire. Fire can refine. It can do so many positive things. It can keep you warm in the winter. Uh, but fire can also burn you. It can also kill you. It can hurt you. Proverbs 29.2 says this. It says, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, the people groan. Another translation says, when justice rules a nation, everyone is glad, and when injustice rules, everyone groans. Now, my story of engaging in government um, started really when I was a kid. So I grew up actually in Africa, in Liberia. My parents were missionaries in Liberia. And then I ended up um, really during college, when I was 16 years old, my God really broke my heart uh, for ministry. And I felt called to ministry. I always felt like I was going to serve the Lord in Africa full time. I was just going to move here to Africa. Because I always sensed that the church was pretty dead in America, but it was alive in Africa. So I just felt like that's where I should be. And so I always thought that I was going to move to Africa. And it wasn't until college that God really broke my heart uh, for the needs of the poor. And I saw the needs in urban America. And um, so I was really challenged uh, in college in that area. And um, I remember in college when I had to pick my major, I, I said, you know what, I'm called to serve the Lord in ministry, and so I'm going to stay away from business, because everybody that works in business, all they do is care about money, and I'm going to stay away from government, because it seems like everybody who goes into government just cares about power, and I'm going to serve the Lord. And in fact, after I graduated from college, I gave everything that I had away to go live and work among the poor in Boston. Because I felt like so many people that were doing the work of justice didn't really understand what it was like on the grassroots level. And as I spent time living among the poor in Boston, I began to see that government and business has a lot to do with how cities are organized. It has a lot to do with how resources are distributed. It has a lot to do with which people have what opportunities and so I started off homeless in Boston, but I ended up going to Harvard, to the Kennedy School of Government, to study public policy, not as a step away from government, uh, not as a step away from ministry, but as a step uh, towards ministry, to help see the church uh, engage in the government sector. And so one of the things that I uh, didn't realize at the time was that God would later call me uh, to plant a church in Washington, D.C., which we call the District Church. I had no idea when I was studying public policy at the time that the Lord would send me to a city where the majority of the people are called to the work of public service. And it was a few years into our church, it was about five years ago, uh, that a young man named Michael Brown, an African-American man, uh, was shot and killed after he um, was 
uh, gunned down by a police officer after uh, stealing um, some small things from a convenience store. You guys might have heard about this story. Uh, several months later, the police officer was let go. He was acquitted, and protests erupted in this little town called Ferguson outside of St. Louis, Missouri. And they actually, uh, um, protests really broke out across the United States. And um, one of the things that our church did uh, was we wrote as, as pastors a response uh, to that of saying, hey, we need to come together in this time of racial disunity, and we need to come together as the body of Christ. And one of the folks in our church that worshiped with us worked very closely with President Obama and called me over that Thanksgiving weekend right when uh, protests were erupting across the country and invited me to a meeting at the White House on the Monday following Thanksgiving. And I assumed that the meeting was kind of a low-level meeting with just a few people where it's typically, you know, it's just, it's, it's just a formality. There's not really any substance that happens in some of these meetings. And so I was like, you know what, that's my day off, that's my Sabbath, I need to check my schedule, make sure I can come. Well, then she calls me the next morning and she says, is it okay for your name to be on the press release? I'm like, why are you doing a press release for like some small meeting at the White House? She said, well, President Obama is hosting the meeting and most of the cabinet's gonna be there and uh, we wanted to make sure it was okay if your name was on it. And so ended up um, meeting President Obama, who knew about our church, knew about DC 127, our foster care and adoption ministry. And what was supposed to be a 30-minute meeting with the youth from Ferguson and with some police chiefs and his cabinet and a few pastors ended up turning into a two-and-a-half-hour conversation about race in America with the first black president, first Kenyan president in the United States. Amen. And I walked away from that meeting. Well, I walked into the meeting like, what am I doing here? But I walked away from that encounter and that meeting being so clear about my own calling. That my own calling wasn't to politics, but my own calling was to pastoral ministry. And what was so desperately needed in that two and a half hour conversation as we tried to figure out a way forward in our country is we needed the church to be the church and for the church to be a visible witness of what it looks like to come together across racial lines and worship the one true living God. These couple encounters made me ask myself, how is it that we engage the church in government. What, is, what does that look like? And I know our context in, in the U.S. is much different um, than where you may be from, so you'll have to kind of apply this in your own context, but I'm grateful that we have the Word of God to teach us principles and that we are not the first people to try to discern how to be brave in influencing the government. Paul writes in Romans chapter 13, Romans chapter 13, Paul is talking about new relationships. He's talking about, in, in, in chapter 12, he's talking about new relationships uh, with God, a new relationship with one another, a new relationship with enemies. And then in chapter 13, he's talking about what does it look like to have a new relationship with the government. And he's basing his theology on an encounter, um, on, a, on a passage of Scripture of where the Pharisees came to Jesus and they were trying to trap him as they usually do. And they're saying, you know, who, what do we do? Do we, do we pay taxes to, to Caesar, to Rome, or do we give to God? They, they thought it was kind of an either or question. They were trying to trap him. And you guys know the story. He said, give to Caesar what's to Caesar, Caesar's, and what to God what is, to, is God's. And there's this sense that, you know what, you actually can serve both God and government. And with that, Jesus established the legit legitimacy of government. And Paul builds upon that here in Romans 13. He says this, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. Somebody say, for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason, 
They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Paul clearly articulates here the purpose of government is to both restrain evil, because without a police department, without a rule of law, without the enforcement of the rule of law, evil can go unchecked. And evil can rule in a nation. So there's a a role of government to restrain evil. But the more positive role of government is not just to restrain evil, but to promote good, to promote justice, promote what's in the common good of everyone. Now, the mission of the church, the purpose of the church, Jesus gave us in the Great Commission, which is to go out and make what? To make disciples, to make disciples of all nations. And so the church has a clear purpose that, that Jesus has given us. And the government has a clear purpose. They're distinct purposes, and we must understand the relationship with them. Sometimes we confuse them. One of the things that I believe that we have to understand as Christians who are boldly engaging in government is that there are times when we are to submit to government and to serve the government, and there are times when we are to resist the government. And we need to ask God to give us wisdom to know the difference between the two. Now, when Paul is writing here in Romans 13, he is, he is articulating that we must submit and serve the government. And the context there is that there were some uh, Christian zealots who were being pretty radical in their response. In fact, some of them were becoming violent in their protest of Rome. The other thing that was happening is that Caesar had kicked out the Christians from Rome, and they had now just recently returned to Rome, and Paul is trying to get the gospel message out, and what he's trying to do is to not have all of the resistors create a distraction from the preaching of the gospel. He's saying, don't just cause ruckus to cause ruckus. But we also see throughout Scripture that Christians at times are called to resist government, When government asks the people of God to violate a command of God, or when the government asks someone to do an immoral act or to go against your conscience. Remember in Exodus, when Pharaoh ordered the Hebrew midwives to kill their newborn babies, and some of them refused to obey. And thank God, because Moses lived and God raised him up. Or what about King Darius, who makes a decree that nobody should pray to anyone but him. But Daniel refuses to obey, and what happens? He gets sent into the lion's den. So when are we to submit? When are we to resist? When are we to serve like Joseph in government, and as Paul writes? And when are we to resist like the apostles? Like in Acts chapter 4. When Peter and John are preaching, the Sanhedrin bring them in. They're saying, they put them in jail, and they say, you have to stop preaching the gospel. And they said, we will obey God and not man, right? And they continue to preach the gospel. What about the prophets like Amos and Micah? What about Daniel? Daniel's a great example of someone who does both. He both serves and submits in government, but he also resists He's a great example of knowing what it looks like to do both. Church, serving and resisting requires us to be brave. It requires us to be brave. And the challenge is to not compromise your values or your integrity or your calling in the process. And my fear is that so many of us as Christians, and this is particularly in the U.S. context, we're sitting on the sidelines. We're not engaging in government. Half of the U.S. population does not even vote in a presidential election, which is just crazy to think about. That We have to be engaged. God's calling us to be engaged. The story of the Bible is the story of a people who were continually tested and yet who continually pressed through their fears, even fears of engaging in rulers and authorities. The Bible is the story of people who are filled with faith that God is bigger than the giants that they are facing in their life. Is anybody still awake today? I know we're ready for lunch. See, Moses was able to face Pharaoh because he first met God in the burning bush. 
Like he had experienced God and he knew that God was bigger than any giant that he would face. Hosea was able to confront the king of Israel because he first met the king of kings in the temple of the living God. David was able to confront Goliath because he had witnessed the power of the one true living God. We have to be a brave church. You know, many of the Israelites were actually afraid to go into the promised land. They were afraid. They had heard the promises of God. They had heard about the land flowing with milk and honey. But they had also heard these reports of there being giants in the promised land. In fact, there was reports when the spies came back about this, about this giant named uh, King, King Og of Bashan. Who had, he needed a bed 13 feet long. They'd heard about these giants. Of course, we heard yesterday from Pastor M about Goliath, who was nine foot nine inches. My point is that many of us are scared to live into God's promises for our lives because we fear the giants. And, and the giants, rather than the Spirit of God, are determining the places we go, who we hang out with, and how we spend our time. We can see the promised land, but we're scared to go in because we've heard of the giants. Maybe we should just go back to Egypt, right? My favorite quote is from A.W. Tozer, the pastor, and he says this, God is looking for people through whom he can do the impossible. What a pity that we plan only the things we can do ourselves. For me, the question is not if we engage government, but the question over the last 15 years of my life has become how do we engage government? And I want to just share a few principles. The first one is that as we influence government, we are to be engaged but not used. Engaged but not used. Oftentimes, politicians and leaders will want to use the church as a means to their ends, as an opportunity for a photo op that doesn't really reflect the sacrifice and the work that they've done, but they want to take credit. They want you just to come and endorse an issue, but not to really speak into the legislative process. And so, church, we have to be engaged but not co-opted to remember that we're playing with fire. Dr. King, Dr. Martin Luther King said it best. He said this, the church must be reminded that it is not the master of the state. In other words, we're not trying to create a theocracy, but rather uh, it's neither the master of the state nor the servant of the state where we just clean up the bad social policy that the government creates. No, we're called to be the conscience of the state. The church must be the guide and the critic of the state and never its tool. And if the church does not recapture its prophetic zeal, it will become an irrelevant social club without moral or spiritual authority. We must be engaged but not used. The second thing is we must be principled but not partisan. This is the challenge for us in the U.S. right now. I don't know if we've ever lived in such a politically divided time between Republicans and And Democrats. And people sometimes will ask me, What are you a Republican or a Democrat? And I say, Name the issue. Right? Right? Because if you're consistently pro life, if you value life from the womb all the way to the end of life to the tomb, then you will not fit into a political party platform, at least in the US. And so, what does it look like to be principled? but to to not be partisan or to not be tribal only. The third thing is this, is to be fearless. We need people who are going to be fearless, who will run for elected office. We need people who are going to be fearless to work in government at every level. It also means, being fearless also means this, and it means not just placing yourself in those positions, but it means being willing to walk away from power when government is asking you to compromise your values or your convictions. And one of the things that I've seen in D.C., because people move to D.C. once they're elected, we're in the city of public service. Our church is located two miles north of the White House, so we're right in the belly of the beast, as I sometimes say. And one of the things I've, I've seen 
is that, I don't know if this is true in Africa, but in the U.S., people get addicted to re-election. And once they've tasted a little bit of that power, they will do anything to hold on to it. And so the day that you get elected is the day that you begin your new campaign for re-election. And you'll try to figure out how to change the Constitution or other things to continue to get re-elected. And it's a real challenge. And, and church, when, we're the, when, when you are called by God to public service, then you realize that serving in government or as an elected official is just one way to serve God. And that's so important for us to understand. When we get addicted to only serving God one way, then we'll be willing to compromise whatever in order to hold that position. We must never compromise when we're asked to disobey God or do an immoral act. Listen to the words of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They said, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. So my hope and my prayer for us is that we would be the kind of church where our faith shapes our politics rather than our politics shapes our faith. That we would lead, that that we would be an example, that we would lead by example as the church. And the government would come and say, how is it that we are to care for kids in need? How, how is it that we are to build housing for the poor? How is it that we are to relate across races? How is it that we are to do these things? Because government has the opportunity and the ability to scale and do things at a much bigger level than the church can ever do through our tithes and offerings. Can feed way more people. But we need to be the example of how that looks like and the quality of that. And so I'm praying that God would raise us up as a church body to be a credible witness, to have the moral authority to speak truth to power. To remember that even those of us who are working in government, those of us who, who are praying for those in government, to realize that being in power in government is actually a temporary thing, right? God says the government shall be upon my shoulders, right? Right? What did, what did Pilate say to Jesus at the end of his life? He said, don't you realize I have the power to either free you or crucify you? And Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. It is an awesome thing to serve in government. It's an awesome thing to serve in public service. I wonder if there's anybody here today. Why don't, you, why don't we just stand as I want to pray, pray over you guys if you're able to stand. I wonder if there's anybody that's here today that is currently serving in government at any level, in any country of the world. Is there anybody that currently serves in government? Would you just raise your hand right where you are? I want to be able to pray for you. I see some folks right over here, over there in the back. Yes, over there. You're currently serving in government. Can you just keep your hand up over here, over here, serving in government? God, I thank you for those that you have put in positions of authority to lead in counties and states and countries. God, I pray, God, that they would see the impact of their leadership, that you would help them to, to represent you well, that you would fill them with wisdom and with your Holy Spirit, that they would be committed to justice and righteousness. I wonder if there's anybody in here that feels like maybe government and politics is your sector that you may be feeling called into at some point in your life or maybe to run for office or just to work in some level. Would you raise your hand? You're, you're not currently working, but you're just open that maybe God would lead you there at some, some point. Yeah, I see hands all, all throughout. Maybe you, and God, I pray for each and every person that maybe feel called to this sector. God, I pray that they would stay rooted in you, rooted in the church, rooted in the gospel. God, I pray for supernatural favor. 
that you would open up doors that only you can open up for divine appointments. God, I pray for a servant heart. And I pray that you, God, would get the glory. We thank you. We pray it in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And all the church together said, amen.